My name is uh, Juniator Tullius. I am a research fellow of Earth Observatory of Singapore. Uh, we are now a, around the Bay of Kature. Uh, the place uh, I passed through during my fieldwork doing my PhD in 2004. And when I arrived in this uh, bay, I saw many fish floating and at the end of the uh, bay when I start crossing the, 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 the strait to reach another island the sea was really rough and I was driving uh, my uh, uh, canoe using that motor 20 horse uh, 25 horsepower and I was afraid of uh, facing such a big wave after passing through that uh, strait and then we safely arrived on the other side of the island, we stopped uh, in a village and then I met my friend and he heard the news that an uh, earthquake occurred around Aceh and tsunami also uh, come after. And according to the news, we heard that the numbers of uh, casualties and then they start telling the numbers of people dead. And we were starting to understand uh, that why there's those so many fish at the time floating on this uh, uh, bay. Because after the earthquake occurred, uh, that water were, was receding and those fish probably against the currents and then they stranded on the land for a couple of minutes and then fished dead and then the water again uh, increased come up to the to the to the land and then wash the fish and then fish eventually uh, uh, wash away and floating on this bay so that's experience quite interesting to understand how uh, this earthquake in Aceh may have effect or consequence in this bay in Mentawai, especially on Cebu. The distance is quite far, but the consequence is uh, real that happened here as well. The 2004 earthquake devastated coastlines in Aceh and areas surrounding the Indian Ocean, and it hit in an area where we weren't really expecting an event like this. So it was a wake-up call that we needed to better understand the hazards of the region. The earthquake had a magnitude of around 9.1, making it the largest earthquake anywhere in the world in the previous 40 years. It was followed three months later by a magnitude 8.6 earthquake in the area just to the south. This event was the largest in the modern era, and it was documented with new technologies in unprecedented detail. It transformed our understanding of earthquakes themselves, and it spurred a huge amount of research all over the world to better understand some processes and phenomena that we had observed for the first time in 2004. There's a couple of things that have come out of the research following 2004. Um, one is that uh, there are historical predecessors uh, that are recorded in the geological history. Uh, the other thing we were able to do was to use the sediments to reconstruct the hydrodynamics of what happened when the tsunami came on shore. And this is an important application of geoscience because it, it, it informs uh, coastal engineering in places that are susceptible to tsunamis. You know, the rupture process that generates an earthquake-generated tsunami uh, is rather complicated and multifaceted. And as such, the, the, there's no real model that will perfectly replicate the event. And so, we still have to move forward and uh, use the best models that we have, but we do have to acknowledge that there is always going to be limitations to what we can actually say uh, about what happened that day. And uh, you know, we still haven't got a perfect model and perfect understanding of exactly what happened during the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami.
what we were looking for was could we find evidence of that event occurring in the past? And that is not easy. That is not easy when you are on a coastline that is always rapidly changing. That is not easy on a coastline that doesn't have long instrumental or historical records. So we searched that coastline. During the years following 2004, we searched lakes in Thailand. But then we met EOS researchers who said that there were caves along the Aceh coastline that had evidence of the 2004 tsunami. That is that when the 2004 tsunami occurred, sand was pushed in by the tsunami waves into the cave. We went into the cave around the year 2007, 2008. What we saw was the most amazing site of geological sediment I've ever seen. We had the black, black guano, a white sand layer and a black black guano and a white sand layer and on and on and on stretching down when we were able to find the sediments and date them through a technique known as radiocarbon dating we found out that we had the first ever continuous sequence of tsunamis for Sumatra stretching back eight thousand years. So I study coral microatolls. These are corals that start growing right below low tide. They grow up until they grow high enough or the water level drops low enough that their upper surface dies but they continue to live below what we call the highest level of survival, and they grow outward and upward from below that highest level of survival. And as these corals grow, which can be for decades to centuries, they track sea level change through their lifetimes. When an earthquake happens, sometimes the land moves up or down. And so by studying changes in water level, we can infer changes in land height, which allows us to infer earthquakes and other tectonic processes that have happened in the past. When we went to the field area on Simulu and, and other parts of Aceh and northern Simulu right after the earthquake, we found that some of these coral microatolls had been uplifted out of the water and killed. And we realized that we could, if we found older microatolls that had died in earlier earthquakes and we could date them, we could figure out when these past earthquakes have occurred, how big they were, and we could even answer questions like how often they occur. So the Sumatran subduction zone is part of the Southeast Asian ring of fire. You can see it in the image behind me. And that's this ring of plate bounding faults that generate earthquakes and also volcanoes that, that surround our region. As we know, the Sumatra subduction zone has experienced a sequence of large earthquakes since 2004, and most of the areas along the subduction zone has already ruptured. However, there is a section in Mantawai Island, west of Sumatra, has not ruptured yet. And we won't be surprised if a big event happened there one day. I have been working in Sumatra subduction zone for more than a decade. More recently, I have been working with Center for Geohazard Observation, CGO, and our Indonesian collaborators to focus on the Mantawa seismic gap to study the seismic potential there. The role of CGO is to enable to, and support the research of EOS. Um, our tasks are mainly to install, maintain, and manage um, geohazard observation stations around our region. SUGAR stands for uh, Sumatran GPS Array. The idea really is to have lots of stations, lots of collection points to collect all those important information about the deformation of those areas. And shortly after, 2004 came and then there was this Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. 
they uh, put in more effort all right, and expanded the, uh, the array to include more uh, station. So my research is uh, data driven. I need a lot of uh, observation data at the Earth's surface, like those measured by GNSS stations. And CGO has this GNSS capability. Uh, they are able to build in-house low-cost low equipment. And by using low-cost equipment, we are able to build a very dense network to monitor the seismic gap. Now I believe we have about more than 40 GPS stations uh, scattered along the western coast of Sumatra and off the uh, western islands. Right. They have been doing great, all right, uh, mainly because of the collaborative effort between uh, Green and US to ensure that the station uh, continue to function. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, in this team, uh, from Green, I'm the principal investigator. Basically, the data here is sent directly to our server in Jakarta, also to EOS. This collaboration has been, uh, I guess it's more than 20 years for this network. It's very important because we, we actually, we don't have that uh, enough capacity and uh, expertise to build the network ourselves. So that's why in Indonesia we need to collaborate, for example, with Singapore uh, to support us in observing this Sumatra. Also, because Singapore is uh, quite uh, close to the Sumatra and uh, it will affect Singapore also when we have that mega trust. Uh, just like the previous earthquake in Aceh in 2004, all affect Singapore and Thailand and all of Southeast Asia. Uh, this entails a lot of fuel work to go to the field, uh, go to the remote islands and go to the hills to, to, to check on the servability and part replacement uh, of, this, uh, of this station. Uh, how we go about doing it is in close collaboration with uh, our uh, Indonesian partner. Uh, we go to the field together, uh, we plan out the field work together, uh, we ensure we work in unison such that uh, you know, uh, the partnership you know, uh, will continue to be maintained and flourish uh, and enable the data to be collected on a continuous uh, basis. From the time series of data, mm. uh, starting 2002 and until now, uh, until now there is a co-seismic in this station. Yeah, basically since one of the oldest stations in Sugar, uh, it has seen so many earthquakes. Yeah. So, We've seen a lot of co-seismic, co-seismic uh, from biggest earthquake in 2004, 2005, 2007, so 2009, I think. all the way yeah. up until now. Yeah. So the earthquake impacted many parts of the Earth system but we can also turn that around and think about hum how humans are impacting the Earth system and, and therefore the, the hazards that we're exposed to. Our resilience to ha earthquake hazards, it's impacted by where we live, to the strength of the, our buildings, how prepared the community is, and it's also impacted by how healthy the environment is. So if, if we degrade the environment, it, it can impact the hazards as well. For example, if we cut down trees on a slope, then we might increase the hazards from landslides being generated following an earthquake. Healthy, healthy ecosystems and a healthy environment is generally protective. Uniquely what we try and do is put all these threats together. We try to think about what would happen if there was an earthquake and a tsunami at the same time that there was either a heat wave or a typhoon. What would happen if there was a volcanic eruption on a coastline at the same time that would, there would be a tropical cyclone devastating the coastline areas? Okay, nama saya Andreas Sepungan. Saya lahir di Mentawai di Mailepet dan saya asli orang Mentawai dan tahun 2013 saya bekerja di tim Sugar ini. 
si istilahnya kayak ini kan kayak kemarin kan ada isu megatras apa segala macam kadang-kadang di keluarga saya juga sering bilang kok orang takut megatras ini, ini segala macam kalian kok langsung bekerja di situ dan saya jelaskan yang namanya pekerjaan memang harus kita jalankan yang mana namanya risiko itu bukan kita yang apa yang namanya misalnya ada musibah apa segala macam kita bukan tahu kemudian tentang yang megatras itu kadang-kadang saya jelaskan sama orang rumah sama keluarga juga jangan terlalu percaya kalian. Do we feel afraid or do we feel threatened by this because unknown? To some extent yes because this is uncertainty make us uh, difficult make us difficult to predict and to plan what we are going to do. But what is more important? Educate yourself. Finding information, right information, uh, right source of information, this is also important. So I asked, I, I mentioned uh, to, to different groups of people here, to the society, to the community, you know, you should not be uh, feel threatened by that. You should not be stressful for that because life must go on. Untuk sekarang ini, kita harus siap mengingatkan kita, kadang-kadang kan kita terlena. Kadang-kadang kan karena udah lama tidak ada isu gempa ini segala macam tsunami ini tidak ada isu. Makanya kan tidak ada masalah, tidak ada salahnya mereka ingatkan kita bahwa kita selalu mengingat bahwa tsunami itu memang berbahaya, gempa itu memang berbahaya. Itu makanya kan 